Hello, everyone. If you saw funny words here, it's because it was trying to translate Spanish into Spanish, and it was very confused. But I will be speaking in English, and there are some subtitles here. They won't be perfect. Sometimes they will say funny things that I did not say, but um, it is nice to have them there. So hello, I am so happy to be here. I'm so happy to see many of you today. Uh, hopefully you are excited about the new school year. I am excited to be here. I know there was some introduction already, but this is me. Uh, I am here with you all to offer a master's level specialization in people analytics. People analytics is my passion. Tell you a little bit of what it is. Uh, but I teach that here. I teach at a university in the USA in Seattle, Washington, and also at UC Berkeley in California. I've taught at a lot of other schools as well. I have taught in the United Kingdom. I have taught in Sweden. I have taught in Russia. I have taught in a lot of different places. So I'm excited to be able to do that here as well. Before I became a professor, I was, in, I was a professional in the HR, human resources space. I was a vice president and executive at General Electric, doing all sorts of things with human resources, learning, analytics, technology, all these kinds of things. So I wanted you to know a little bit about my background. I am a psychology student as well. I studied psychology. I also studied communications. I then went on to do industrial psychology. How many of you are in industrial psychology? Oh, all right. I am excited. So I love psychology. Uh, how many of you will take psychometrics? Ah. That was my specialization. I loved psychometrics. Hola, Sylvia. <laughs> so that is something I found, and it, it turned out to be something that I loved. What is funny about it is when I was started out in psychology, I didn't start out wanting to do industrial psychology. I actually wanted to do animal psychology. And I'll tell you that in my career too, but I started out wanting to work with animals and then ended up working with people in businesses, which is kind of like working with animals. They just wear clothes. Uh, after that, I went to work for a while. And then later, I wanted to go back to school and get my PhD. So I got a PhD in what they call human capital management. It's kind of like HR, except that the focus is that people are valuable, that they are the most important, valuable thing in a company, and that we need to treat them like capital, as valuable as money, as valuable as things, more valuable than money, more valuable than things. So that is what I studied, and I focused a lot on competencies or capabilities, and I did my whole dissertation on that. For my career, I did start out in psychology research, and I did work with monkeys. I spent three years training monkeys how to play computer games. Let's, let's see, it. yeah, see, sí. es cierto. <laughs> that is not a translation problem. I really did teach monkeys how to play video games and then watched their brain patterns to see how they learned. So that was how I started my career. Uh, it's a little different, it's a little funny. And it was part of a study to help NASA understand how your brain will work when you're trying to push buttons in very extreme situations, like being sent up into space. Uh, we even had some of our materials go on the space shuttle Challenger, or sorry, lo siento, Challenger died, um, Discovery. We had some of our stuff go on the space shuttle Discovery. 
Uh, after the monkeys, I realized that I didn't want to play with animals for my whole life. I still like animals. I still like to go see them. But I learned that I started to like data, which is really weird because I hated data. I hated math. I hated analytics. I took a statistics class, and I kind of failed. Like, you can admit it, who does not like math? OK, I totally understand. The reason I went into psychology is because someone told me there was very little math in it. And I was like, yes, that's the right one. But when I went into research, you have to do some math. You have to do some statistics. And I started to learn what you could do with it. And while I was researching something for my monkeys, I needed to learn how to do this statistics thing. And the only article that I could find was a business psychology article. And so I was reading it just to learn how to do analytics. And when I read it, the whole article was how they were using data to avoid discrimination in the workplace. And it was an analysis to help identify if organizations were unfairly only hiring certain types of people. And I went, oh, you can do that? You can make the world better with numbers? What? And then I had to go learn data because I never learned it before. So then I had to take more classes because I was, I, I didn't like math until I knew what you could do with it. And then when I knew what you could do with it, it opened up this whole new world for me. And that's when I went into industrial psychology and I started doing some consulting work and I moved into human resources. And I did a lot of data work on how do we find opportunities to make the workplace better using data information. And that made me very unique in human resources. I was one of the only people who wanted to use data. So when there was something that needed an answer, I was the person everybody called and said, hola there, and they like, we need some help. And that is how I really got to progress in my career, is people started to know that I was the person with the facts. I was the person with the answers, with the numbers. And over the course of my career, I got promoted, and then promoted, and then promoted. And before I know it, I was an executive in a very big company with lots of teams around me. But I think it was all because I knew that data and information is what you can use to really get ahead. I did that for a long time. And then I realized, I want to help other people know this too. When I went to school, nobody talked about this stuff. You probably don't hear anybody talk about the numbers and the analytics very often, sometimes. But it's still really new. And because it's so new, I wanted to go into the universities and help students learn about it early in their careers and to get a little bit more classes and opportunities to learn about this while you're still in school. So I became a professor. And I currently work at both UC Berkeley and University of Washington. And that's also why I am here. And so we start one of our classes tonight. We have a people analytics class. And it starts this evening, January 10th. And we will have a group of professors and students and all different people coming together to learn about how do we use analytics and data to make really smart decisions to make the workplace better. And I'm doing this as part of a Fulbright scholarship. So I am what they call a Fulbright scholar, where the United States sends their educators 
to other places to share their work and their ideas. And so I am lucky to be here. That is the United States ambassador and me um, saying hello. That was the last time I was here in Guatemala. And so this is part of what I'm doing as my Fulbright as well. So what I want to talk about today, it will be new for probably all of you. It is a little bit of a business school topic and a psychology topic and a human resources topic. But the reason why I chose this one is the last time that I came to Guatemala and I was talking to business people, the people you all might work with one day, they were all very interested in the topic of return of investment and how HR can lead to what they call ROI, return on investment. And so I wanted you all to know just a little about it so that if you end up talking to other professionals or you end up in these kinds of positions, you'll have that background as well. So human resources, I think you familiar with the topic human resources? Hannah, yeah, okay, getting lots of head nods, good. It's hard to be in the psychology program and not hear about it. But human resources is a function in the business that focuses on anything about the workers or the workplace. And human resources is actually still somewhat new of a business function. By new, I don't mean in the last couple of years, I mean the last hundred, couple hundred of years. And that's because HR has been evolving and growing and changing in the way that it is. So HR does include lots of things around what we would call personnel. And that's things like making sure people get their money when they do work, uh, making sure that they have benefits, handling the hiring of employees, the firing of employees, having different policies, dealing with problems when they come up. That's actually the hardest part of HR. Um, but personnel are the like day-to-day -day things that you have to do no matter what. And then over time, it has become human resources where you still do all of these things, but you do more now. Now human resources is doing things like onboarding, that meaning they're helping people when they get the new job know how things work and how they get around. They're not just hiring people, they're spending time doing recruitment, saying, oh, let's look for the best people, let's talk to a whole bunch of different ones. There's effort now spent on trying to keep employees so that they don't quit and go somewhere else. Learning and development is an entire area where we can help employees grow their skills and develop. Performance management, how do we help make sure that all employees are being productive and doing their work? and also keeping employees engaged. So when you talk through human resources uh, currently, you will see most of these topics. Some companies don't do all of them, some do all of them. Uh, but one thing that's not common are, is where human resources is going today. So this is something almost every company does. This is something most companies do, not all, some do it better, some do it worse. And this is the future. This is where human resources is going. Some companies are doing some of these today, some are not. But this is what we would call strategic human resources. So instead of just making sure that the employees are there, that they're hired, that they're happy, it's going a step further and saying, how can we help the business understand the value? How do we connect with functions like finance? How do we use new technology, new systems, new processes? How do we use data and analytics? It's things like focusing on well-being. With the pandemic, there became a lot of focus on how can we help employees be mentally uh, able to work and how do we keep them safe and healthy? There is also now work happening around how do we have a competitive advantage? Meaning, 
how do we make sure our company gets all the good people and we steal them from everybody else? Like we want all the good ones and we're gonna uh, do better than our competitors. Things like employer branding. So that thing like how do we get people to want to come work for us? How do we get people to want to be here? And then also focusing on diversity and inclusion. And that's becoming much more popular these days uh, globally. It looks different in every company and it looks different in every geography, but it's becoming a really common new topic. So these are what I would call the future of HR. This is also where you can have a lot more alignment around strategic outcomes. I focus on the first two a lot. Those are what I do, that's what I teach, that's what I, um, but you can, you can use these across the board. So you can do things like ROI of any type of function or area. You can use analytics anywhere. You can use technology anywhere. Okay, so when I say strategic HR, this is a definition from the Society of Human Resource Management. Uh, strategic human resource management involves a future-oriented process of developing and implementing HR programs that address and solve business problems and directly contribute to major long-term business objectives. So strategic HR is this opportunity to do things now that are gonna make the future even better. And the way that we get to strategic instead of just HR practices is these are the different HR processes that might happen. But the difference between just doing something in HR, the difference between just recruiting and hiring people and doing it with strategic intent is to align it with the business. A lot of times we get busy doing our own jobs that we forget about connecting it to other parts of the business. And that's really where the strategic alignment comes in. And uh, when you can do this business alignment, that's where you have something that's going to create impact for the business. That's where you can show the value. And there are ways to show that value and uh, connect it all together. So um, as my friend, Jeff Higgins, likes to say, uh, no business case, no money. If you want to do something and you need money to do it, you better be able to tie it back to the business or else People will just say, no, no, you can't do that. You don't have, the, you don't have it connected. Uh, Jeff is also going to be part of our course that we are offering here. Jeff is a former chief financial officer. He is the founder of Human Capital Management Institute, and uh, he is joining me in some of the classes in our program here as well. He's a great guy. All right, so when we connect the business strategy with HR, we're doing that so that HR is able to be successful and able to have impact. Impact just means to have a really strong effect or outcome. And one of the best ways to do that is to show things like ROI or return on investment. Now, this is a uh, definition from Wikipedia. It's not academic, but this is a definition of ROI. And it has kind of some extra financy words. But um, what ROI is, is it is a performance measure. So it's just a, a number, a value that says, how are we doing? Are we doing good? Are we doing bad? How are we doing? But it does it specifically around how much benefit, how much good do you get out of a certain amount of effort? So there's an equation, there's definitions, but ROI is most simply just this. Are your benefits more than your costs? And you can think about ROI for everything you do in your life. If you're thinking, should I cook my own dinner tonight? You will say, okay, well, the benefits are I can cook exactly what I like, it tastes really good, it'll be hot right when I eat it. But the costs are, I have to buy the groceries, I have to chop everything, I have to cook them. And you might decide whether you think the benefits are greater than the cost. Because maybe instead you'll just eat a bag of chips because you're lazy. I do that sometimes. But that is an ROI conversation. Is the benefit more than the cost? 
And if you take that mindset, you could take it into anything you do, but if you take it into HR, it lets you start to show the real value of what an idea or a process might be. So I'm gonna to try to walk you through an example. Um, just so I know, has anybody done an ROI calculation before? Oh, you're lucky, you have all escaped it so far. Uh, you might come across it in, a cert in certain finance or economics classes, but I'm gonna walk you through a really simple example. Don't freak out when you see numbers. There are going to be a couple numbers, but they'll be okay. So let's pretend that you work in HR. You get a job in HR at a small company. The company has about 24 employees, and you want to implement a new employee recognition process. Why do you want to do this? Well, because you started working there about three months ago, we call that a quarter in business. They talk about like four quarters in the year. So you noticed that in the last quarter, the last three months, four people left. And you asked someone, you're like, is that normal? And someone said, yeah, it's about four people every quarter. And you're like, that's a lot. That's bad, right? And I don't like that. Let's fix it. And you know, you're, you're in the HR department, so you want to do something. You want to reduce the turnover, or we would call it increase retention, meaning we don't want people to leave, we want them to stay. So you go online, hello Google, and you ask Google, how do I help keep people? How do we improve employee retention? And you find a great article, which by the way, I linked one here, and you find a great article that says, hey, if you do an employee recognition program, where you recognize employees for their hard work, you can increase retention by 68%. So like, you could keep people, They'll, they will stay if you do this. And oh, by the way, the article also said that you, it helps with recruitment, which is like, yay, because then you don't have to hire more people, yay. Um, but you find this research. So you have a problem, you have something that you think could help fix the problem, but you don't know, how and what you're gonna do. So you give it some thought. You know this is a very small company. You don't have a lot of money to do big events. You can't bring in a whole new technology platform. And you might be the only person in HR. So you don't have a lot of time. So you decide to sit down and you come up with an idea. And you just decide, you know what? What if every quarter, every month, what if every month we ask for nominations of the best employees? And every month somebody wins. And we say, congratulations, you're the employee of the month. And we give them a small prize, like 500 quetzales. Just something nice to say, oh, thank you, you're so great, we like you. So you get recognition and you get just a little reward. If you did this, it would cost you uh, 1,500 quetzales every quarter, because there's three months in a quarter, so you'd Pay one person 500, another person 500, another person 500. So this is the cost. This is what it would cost for you to do it. And oh, by the way, there are studies saying even small amounts make a very big difference. So you think you want to propose this, but even though you think it's a good idea, you're like, I don't think my boss will say yes. I don't know how to tell them it's a good idea. I'm, I'm new, I haven't worked here very long, they don't know me, how can I convince them to do this? That's where you can start to use things like ROI. You can talk like a business person and say, well, let's calculate the ROI, the return on investment. Are the benefits more than the cost? And you can start by getting your data. You already have your data. You already know that four people leave there are only 24 people in the company. So four divided by 24, here's the math, sorry. Uh, it says that 16.7 or 17% of the people who work there quit. 17% say bye and they just leave. Um, and you have that data already. So you start with that. And then you take that research that you found and you say, okay, well, 
if we start a rewards program, like a recognition and rewards program, if that article is correct, and if we can reduce turnover by 68%, meaning 68% fewer people leave, well then we could say that that, uh, that turnover rate, that 16.7, would actually drop all the way down to 5.3%. And what that means is that instead of losing four employees during a quarter in three months, instead of losing four, you would only lose one. If you were in HR, you would be like, oh, that'd be so nice because it's so much work when somebody quits and it's so much work to have to hire somebody new. That'd be so great. If you're in HR, you would already be happy. You'd be like, I'm sold. I love it. It's a great idea. But if you're not in HR, you're like, mm, I still don't want to pay people. You, you want me to give money away that I'm not currently giving. So unfortunately, you have to go a couple more steps. You have to get to how much money would you save if you did this? So you can go online again. Thank you, Google. Google does all the work for us now. Google was not this good when I was in school. It's so great. You can go on Google, and you can find out that when you have to replace someone, when one person quits and you have to hire a new person, you can typically expect to spend a certain amount of the salary that you'd pay that person to replace them. And for like entry-level jobs, it's about 16%. For mid-level jobs, it's about 20%. For really high positions, like executives or those with really special skills, it can sometimes take twice as much money to replace them as it costs to pay them. And that's because, think about it, how do you hire a new CEO? You know, how do you find a new person? It will take a very long time. You'll have to do a bunch of searching, a bunch of interviews. But there are studies that can tell you how much it costs to replace someone. And when you know that, now you know how much money you can save if you don't have to replace people. If you don't have to spend time and money to find a new person, you can save a lot of money. So if we take those numbers, and there's too much math to run through all of them, so I'm just, we're gonna go with a really simple example. We're gonna say, let's pretend those four employees who left were all mid-level employees. And let's just say that we are going to fix that level. Instead of four people leaving, it will be one, uh, we're going to pretend, for the sake of this example, that a mid-level employee makes about 25,000 quetzales, and so we could figure it out from there. If you really did work at this company, you would know the real numbers, because you could just pull up their salary and multiply it, but we're going to use this as an example. So if we had four employees who were making 25,000 quetzales a year, losing one mid-level employee, we could figure out how much that cost us. We'd say 25,000 quetzales times 20% to replace them equals 5,000 quetzales. So now you know exactly how much money it costs to replace every employee. So if we were losing four employees, that means four employees 5,000 quetzales for every employee, it was costing you 20,000 quetzales every quarter to replace the people who left. That's how much money you were already spending. The company was spending it then. But now, if you only lose one employee, you're only paying 5,000 quetzales to replace the one employee, which means you're saving where you have a benefit of 15,000 quetzales. Anybody remember how much the program was going to cost every quarter? Yeah. So, and good job, those who remember the number. With these numbers, you can now calculate your return on investment because you know your benefit, and, which was 15,000. You know your cost, which was 1,500. And if you put that into the equation, and again, you don't have to memorize the equation, you just go on Google, 
hello, Google, how do I calculate ROI again? And then Google will tell you, and then you put the numbers in. 900% um, that seems crazy, right? That's huge. That means that if you spent 1,500 quetzales just for a little regalito, uh, if you give them just a little present, then you could see you getting a return of 900% back. And that's your way of saying, guess what, company? I am saving you so much money. And all I'm doing is asking for recommendations for rewards, 500 quetzales every month, and I am saving you a ton of money. Oh, by the way, we might also be doing better with recruiting because people want to work somewhere where they are recognized and rewarded. Oh, by the way, our employees are happier because we only have 24 employees. Possibly everybody could get rewarded in two years' time. People will feel loved, they will feel recognized, they will be happier, possibly they will work harder. And so now you have everything to go talk to your boss, talk to the business, and say, I have data to prove why this is going to be good and I'm gonna save you so much money. Most important step is then you celebrate because you just proved how special you are. You just went into this job and you helped the employees be recognized. You saved the company money every single quarter and you showed how valuable HR can be. Sometimes HR doesn't get the credit for the work that it does. Even if you had done an employee recognition program, HR doesn't always get the credit for 900% return on investment. But if you can talk about it in the business language, you can show the company how much value you bring. I think this way of thinking, this way of talking, uh, honestly, I think this is why I advanced in my career as fast as I did. I didn't just say, I want to do a recognition program. I said, I want to save you money, and I want to make people happy, and here is everything to prove it. So it's not just about doing ROI, it's a way of thinking. It's how do we talk about value, how do we talk about return on investment, and how do we bring it in? Now, one thing I will warn you about is sometimes you will do all of this work, and the ROI will be really bad. Sometimes you will learn that it was a bad idea. You will run the numbers and it will be negative. You'll be like, oh no, I'm gonna lose us so much money. But this is good because it can save you from making a bad decision. You can take the same approach, see if it's a positive number, and if it's not, maybe you want to think of a different idea. Maybe you wanna try something else. Maybe you wanna look a little longer, a little uh, different until you can find something. I'll pause here. I know there were numbers, but again, you don't have to memorize this stuff. That's what the internet is for. You just have to know that it exists and then work through it each time that you want to propose something. Questions, comments? Yeah, I was saying I wanted to pick your brain a bit. What do you think people, and sometimes even psychologists, uh, find it so hard to raise the idea that happy employees lead to a better performance or a higher productivity rate? Yeah, such a good question. Um, and, and in the work that I do, we, we call it people analytics. Um, that is our biggest challenge is because there is proof that happier employees are more productive, they have a lot of benefits for the organization, but to your question, there are challenges to that. Uh, all of you, clinical psychology, business psychology, you understand that people are complicated. They are, I like to call it squishy. You can't define a person very easily. And even if you can define a person one day, 
that doesn't mean that's how they feel the next day. So if you ask me if I'm happy, well, today, yes, I am happy today. But if you ask me on another day, maybe I'm not happy that day. And also, our happiness is more than just work. You know, you aren't just happy at work. What if something is happening in your family? What if something is happening in society? What if the... What if you got in a car accident that morning? There are so many variables. And so what gets difficult is when we try to measure something like happiness, uh, other individuals, psychologists actually are, are, you're comfortable with the unknown, but other people are not. So they have a hard time translating something that changes all the time and that is not a firm number into a business number. Uh, that's actually where People analytics and psychometrics can come in. It does mean you have to use what we call proxies, meaning instead of using something like uh, money or time, you might have to use survey results, or you might have to use uh, how many days somebody calls in sick or is absent. Those would be measures of like engagement. And so you do have to spend some effort getting your measurement right, and using psychometrics processes, reliability, validity. But if you can show those, then you can actually run through a really similar process to this. But what ends up happening is you're doing things like this, where you need to use assumptions. And you need to say, well, on average, a happier employee is 10% more productive, or 20% more productive. It won't be exact but it will still be what we call directionally correct. And if you can talk about it intelligently, most people can, can understand that. But it is a big challenge, and it's probably where I spent most of the time in my career is to explain those kinds of things. It's a good question. It's more a comment than a question, yeah. but I worked in HR for like a year, and I don't know, I might sound dumb uh, with this, but this is just like so eye-opening to me because like the struggle I went through every day uh, the whole year that I was working in that is like how do I communicate what I want to do uh, to my boss and inevitably what happened it always ended up happening because I couldn't do it was like no what, how, what why would I spend money on this like I'm already paying them to work why would I want to give them benefits here yeah, <laughs> exactly I'm already paying them why would I give them this yeah But back to uh, my friend Jeff, no business case, no money. Yeah, that's a great comment. And I am sorry about your experiences then, but hopefully you can try to use this in the future. Thank you. Yeah. I wanted to ask something. I don't know how to word it properly, but it came to my attention. All of this value you put on employees, I wanted to ask you, Does this also apply to minimum wage workers? Because I found it very interesting that like huge companies have this tendency of just firing people after three years there. And I mean, it's super interesting this that you, you, you talk about like the value that they put, but it, it, I can't like oversee this problem that I have with these corporations that they fire people and they don't care about their happiness. So I wanted to ask you, And does this ROE also work with these people? Yeah, wow, you said that very well. Um, you explained the biggest thing that I am currently working on. So I spend my time teaching, and then I spend the other part of my time trying to fix this problem. You, you are very good at seeing the big problem out there. So historically, people, in a business are only considered a cost. I have to pay them salary, I have to give them benefits, I have to spend money recruiting, they cost so much money, I have to train them. And that's because for, very, for a very long time, finance was the closest business partner to the president and the CEO, and so everything is thought of like a cost. People were never considered what we call an asset or capital, and there are groups of people, myself, Jeff, who I showed you in the picture, and others, 
We are part of a organization called the International Organization for Standardization, and we are currently working on standard HR measurements to show the value of human capital. And um, I have an article coming out in the MIT Management Review for business leaders around how they need to start putting people on the corporate balance sheet, the place where you put how much money did we make, how much money did we spend, to start putting people as value. Because think about technology companies. Think about Google or uh, I'm going to have Uber in my class next week. Uh, they, all of their value is in people knowing how to code. It's not in buildings, it's not in products, it's in people. You mentioned minimum wage workers. The reason that those roles are there is because it's the humans doing the work. The humans are all of the value. So you called out one of the biggest problems that is not fixed today, that is my goal in life, <laughs> is to get people listed as the value that they generate. Um, the positive news is that a lot of research is now proving that companies who invest in their people, like this example, that would be investing in the people, do get higher ROI back. And we're starting to see that the companies who adopt this process earlier actually are doing better, like in terms of their, their stock prices, how much money they make. And so other companies are like, how are they doing that well? How are they getting all that money? So they're starting to pay attention, but only in the last five years, maybe. So it'll probably take us another 10 or 15 years to really get there. The good thing for you is if any of you are interested in it, when companies want to start to do it, they're going to say, who knows how? Who knows how? Nobody knows how. Even if you are very young, if you know how to do this, you are going to be the only person who knows how to do it and you will get the job. Uh, it's how I ended up getting jobs that I was very young, but I was the only person who knew how to do it. So there's going to become more jobs for this, but very few people because it's not normally in classes and other things. But I really like that you called out that. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you've been traveling a lot uh, for work, mm -hmm. and I wanted to know if you see a big difference, uh, culturally speaking, in HR. Like, is it way different in the US than in Guatemala? And what can we do to adapt to those cultural differences? Yeah, good question. Uh, I haven't spent enough time to know all of the cultural differences, and I also think it's really hard to understand somebody else's culture when you're not from there, so I, I can't speak to everything. But um, there are really big differences in the area that I focus on, which is like analytics, ROI. Um, the United States didn't start really getting into this work until about... 2008, 2010, that's when it kind of started there. And then the United Kingdom was after that, and then places like South Korea, um, a little bit um, in India today, but it's been growing very slowly. And so um, I don't know for sure. I do have friends throughout Latin America as well. I think Latin America is still back in like the 2010, people are starting to hear about it, but they don't believe it yet. They don't know if it's right. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I want to come and have classes and share, because I think the places that aren't there yet can, I don't know how you, like leapfrog. You know, why you don't have to take 10 years like the US did. It took the US 10 years to sort of figure it out. But now there are all these experts who've done it, they've written books, they're working on things like the standards I talk about. So now it's possible for other places to use all of their hard work and then just jump right to where they are. So that's my hope is that um, 
uh, a lot of the early work has been done. And so, uh, it, and it will need to be changed for every culture, but at least they can follow on some of that work. So when you can explain something that's complicated in a simple way, that means you know it well. So thank you for making it simple ah, for us. Thank you. Uh, how do you take into consideration uh, variables like, given the example that you gave, um, let's say the same person gets picked every month because they're the boss's favorite. So instead of being uh, motivation, it upsets employers. Or the opposite, it's mm -hmm. so successful that now they're not friends anymore. They're just competing yeah. all the time. Yeah. How do you take those things into consideration? No, fantastic question. Uh, this is why I love people analytics, and that's what I mean by just the whole area of using data. And the comment about people are complicated. Um, when you find the programs, and actually, thank you. Um, one of the things that I recommend anytime you are starting something like this, maybe you used ROI to propose your idea. But what you really need to be doing all the way through is after you show, this was such a good question for my slide, thank you. Wow, after you show the value and the ROI, you want to continue to identify if there are any problems. So then you have to always be asking yourself what could be a good thing or a bad thing out of this. One bad thing might be, well, we don't want the same people all the time. So maybe we will set processes where you can't win it more than twice in a year, and then it would go to the other person. But you would have to be thinking, how do I identify the problems? And the other thing is to always continue to research and benchmark. So if we had used that article that told us that retention gets better by 68%, that means we need to keep researching to understand what other opportunities, what other problems could come around, and also to understand what other companies are doing. So to benchmark, so we might say, okay, well other companies you know, put a, a maximum on how many times you could get it, or other companies um, included in the, in the recommendation, how the other person is a good collaborator because maybe they want to recognize and reinforce teamwork and positive relationships. So you would, kind of, you would want to continue to research to help guide it, and every time you see a potential problem, oh, someone's complaining because they're getting competitive, then you say, okay, well, how could we make it so that you get rewarded for being a good team member? Uh, the other thing, too, that you'll want to look into is uh, having allies, like friends, within the business. So this is something like making sure that finance understands that you want to have this money spent. This is things like making sure that the person who selects them understands the goal and doesn't always pick their friend or something like that. And then getting buy-in from everybody. So before you do this, making sure people like it. And then um, back to kind of where you're going, you want to track it as you're going along. And if you have this analytical mindset about ROI, you should hopefully, at the end of the next quarter, say, so, how many employees left? Because if four employees still left, it didn't work. Or maybe it takes time, you know, maybe, and so you want to keep tracking, and you would say, okay, next quarter, how many left? Okay, next quarter, how many left? And if after three or four quarters, you're identifying that it's a problem, you might have to change your approach. Um, so the, the hard answer is there's a lot more work even after you do the first set to make sure that it stays. And it can be complicated, but it's a mindset. And if your mindset is that way, you're kind of always thinking that way. My main point is that for those of you, especially those of you going to HR, there is value in HR. Most of us in this room already think that. We're like, yeah, HR, like we care about the people, we're the good guys. But sometimes we need to show that to other people. And sometimes the easiest way to show that to other people is with things like ROI and business value. And so some tips that I will just leave you with and things to think about. It's not just for big companies. I meet a lot of people who say, 
well, yeah, but that's because you used to work for General Electric, or yeah, that's good for Uber and all these big ones. But that example I gave you today, it's 24 people. It doesn't have to be for big companies. You do not have to be a data scientist or a statistician. You just have to know that these things exist. And most people who do something like ROI, again, they'll go, hello, Google, tell me how to do that. And then they look at it and they go, OK, write this number, subtract that number, and then they check their work. You don't have to be really advanced. You can be. You can spend a lot of time, and there's lots to do, but you don't have to be. You can also do this in any area of HR. I just decided to use an example about employee recognition, but you could do this in learning and development. You could do this in recruiting. You can do this in any area. Um, the thing I usually recommend to people with this kind of thinking process is to start really small. Don't try to analyze everything. Don't try to show the value of everything. Find something that's a big problem or is very important. So like if attrition is a big problem, focus on that, start small, and then just make sure to share your findings and track success. Okay, then um, if you want to, I love being contacted and connected. You can follow me on LinkedIn. I have a YouTube channel. You can send me emails. Um, I love uh, connecting and talking about this kind of stuff, so feel free to stay connected with me. And a special thank you to the psychology department for inviting me. I love being part of this with you. And thanks for joining me today, everyone. Thank you.